Hi, thank, thank you all very much uh, for coming. Um, I'm going to go kind of easy on you. I know you've been thinking hard, and uh, what was Imre talking about? Ramsey theory, or how many lines you can join together? There, it'll mostly just be stories uh, for the, this talk. I'll, I'll throw in a little bit of maths just to keep you on your toes, but mostly I want to tell you about, um, about Albert Einstein, about his theory of relativity, about, about what it is, um, why he was thinking about it, um, and also about some of the very latest developments that have happened uh, just this year uh, about this theory. Um, next year uh, is a rather special year for physics. Next year is going to be the 100th anniversary of Einstein's great achievement. Um, so in 1915, uh, Einstein was 36 years old. This is actually a photograph from about two or three years later. As far as I can tell, there are no photographs of Einstein from... Uh, from 1915. Um, he was 36 years old. He was very well known amongst the scientific community. He'd al already done many, many things that would have made him one of the great scientists of the 20th century. Um, but in 1915, he did something really spectacular. It was his greatest achievement, and it really elevated him to one of the greatest scientists of all time. Um, so that's what I want to tell you about. Um, it goes by the name of the general theory of relativity, uh, or if you're a physicist, we just call it general relativity, or mostly just, just GR. Um, here's the punchline. If you take one thing away from this talk, this, this should be it. Uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity is a theory of gravity. In fact, it's, it's better to say it's the theory of gravity. It's now been 100 years, and uh, we've not got anything better to replace it. This is our best understanding of, of gravity. Um, so what this means on small domestic scales is that it's the theory that explains why apples fall from trees and why you're all stuck there uh, on your seats and why if I jump, I don't fly into the air, I, I come back to the stage. Um, but it really comes into its own if we think on big scales. So it's the theory that explains why the moon goes around the Earth and why the Earth goes around the sun and why the sun is one of 100 billion stars that's orbiting an enormous black hole at the center of our galaxy and why our galaxy is one of 100 billion galaxies spread throughout space, all moving inexorably apart as, as the universe expands. So it's really the theory that, that gives us uh, the vision of the universe on, on the very largest scales imaginable. Um, so what I want to do is, is tell you why Einstein uh, was thinking about this and to do that, I need to set the stage a little bit and tell you about some of the things that happened before 1915 um, and what we'd understood about gravity, and in particular what Einstein himself had, uh, was doing before 1915. So that's where we're going. Um, Einstein's theory of gravity wasn't the first. We understood gravity before 1915. Um, the very first theory of gravity uh, is due to Isaac Newton. In 1687, Isaac Newton wrote his masterpiece. Uh, it's a book that's called The Principia. He wrote it... Uh, about 500 meters in, in that direction, uh, in Trinity College. Um, it contains a lot. It's basically the birth of modern science. It's certainly the birth of, uh, of theoretical physics. It explains laws of motion. You've probably you've done Newton's laws of motion in GCSE stuff. Um, and it also contains a law of gravity. Uh, but this is the law of gravity that Newton gave us. Um, how many people have seen this equation before? Really? How many people haven't seen this equation before? Okay, many, many more. Good, good. Let me explain what, what this equation uh, is telling us. This is Newton's uh, equation for, um, uh, for gravity. F on the left-hand side is the force. Um, has, has everybody heard of F equals ma? Is that anybody not? Okay, so F is the force, and it goes into F equals ma, that equation. And what's on the right is the force of gravity. So what, what's going on here? Um, Newton said that, that between any two objects in the universe, just pick two of your favorite objects in the universe, there's a force which attracts them. Okay? The force takes the following form. You take the mass of one object, which is capital M, and the mass of the other object, which is little m, and you multiply them together, and then you divide by the distance squared between those two objects. So the distance between the two objects is r, and you divide by, by r squared. Okay. Um, then you multiply the whole thing by, uh, by g. g is just a random number that's called Newton's constant. It's something like 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 kilograms, blah, 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 you know, that, that kind of stuff. So, so this is the force that, uh, uh, that Newton came up with to um, describe how gravity acts between any two objects in the universe. We think of gravity as acting between big things, between the Earth and the Moon or the, the Earth and the Sun. Uh, Newton told us that's not true. It acts between any two objects that there are in the universe, but in a way that's proportional to the, the mass of the objects, which means it's only when objects get very big that the force gets big enough for us really to be able to, um, to measure it. 
Okay. Um, it's often said that, that understanding this 1 over r squared law is, was Newton's great achievement. It, it's sort of, it's only half true. In fact, there were lots of people around who had figured out that, that gravity goes as, as 1 over r squared. So one of them is Christopher Wren, who built St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, Robert Hooke, who came up with this stupid spring law that you do in GCSE physics. They'd all figured out that this was the right, uh, the right equation for gravity. Um, but they hadn't figured out the most important thing, which was how to show this is the right equation for gravity. So that's what Newton did. Um, so in 1687, um, he, uh, he, he proved the following. Um, it was known from the early 1600s that, that when the planets go around the sun, uh, they don't go around in perfect circles. They actually go around in ellipses. So an ellipse is a slightly squashed circle. And the simplest way to think about an ellipse um, is in terms of what's called a conic section. So here's a cone. And if you take uh, some plane and you slice it through a cone, you can get four different kinds of shapes. So if you slice it exactly horizontally like this, you get a circle. But if you slice it at a slight angle, uh, you get sort of a squashed circle, and that squashed circle is an ellipse. Then there's two ways to slice it so that, well, if you slice it completely vertically, um, I think hmm, if you slice it co completely vertically, you get these shapes which don't close. They just sort of carry on forever. And there's two kinds of shapes you can get from this. One of them is called a hyperbola, and one of them is called a, a parabola. The parabola you may have seen. Parabola is this formula y equals x squared if you, if you draw it a, a quadratic. So um, what Newton really did back in 1687 was to prove the following. It's that if you've got um, a planet which is orbiting the sun, such that the force acting on that planet is always towards the sun, and the size of the force goes as 1 over the distance squared from the sun, the question is, what's the shape of the orbit, given that, that statement? That's what Newton really proved in, in this Principia. That was really one of the, the big first steps of, of modern science. And Newton proved that the possible shapes you can get from this force are exactly these, uh, these geometrical shapes that you get if you slice, um, uh, slice a cone. In particular, if planets go around the sun, they don't have to go in circles, but they do have to go in ellipses. So they do have these very specific shapes as, as they go around the sun. OK, that's Newton's theory. By the way, I should say that if, if, you, if you come and you do maths or you do, you do physics at university, um, this is something you prove either in the first or the second year, depending on where you go and, and what course you do. So it's not something I could, tell, I could explain to you now. It takes a few hours to go from this to this. But it is something that you'll learn very quickly, very soon in, in an undergraduate maths degree. Okay, that's Newton's story from 1687. Um, let me fast forward 250 years uh, or so. So in uh, the early 1900s, um, everybody believed in Newton's theory. And Newton's theory, theory was really the bedrock of science in, in the early 1900s. Um, and then along came Albert Einstein. So this is a picture of Albert Einstein from 1905. Um, he was a cocky young man when he was... Uh, uh, at, at this time. In 1905, Albert Einstein didn't have a job in a university and he didn't even have a PhD, basically because he'd managed to piss off every single person he'd ever come in contact with through a combination of rudeness or laziness or, or arrogance. Um, at some point, things got so desperate for him, he thought um, he, thought he could uh, get himself a job, he could make a good impression on the famous physicists in the world by writing letters to them and pointing out mistakes in all the papers that they'd written. Um, it didn't make him any friends. So in 1905, he uh, finally got a job as a civil servant. He's working as a patent clerk, trying to uh, judge people's inventions at the very lowest rung of the patent clerk office um, in Bern, in Switzerland. Uh, the only good thing about this job was that they gave him lots of time to, to do physics. He could basically finish his week's work in a, in a few hours and just spend the rest of the time thinking. Um, 1905 was a good year for Einstein. In 1905, he wrote three papers, uh, each of which revolutionized a different area of physics. Um, one of the papers proved for the first time that atoms existed. Uh, another paper started off something called quantum theory. Uh, but the paper I want to tell you about here is a paper um, about a theory called special relativity. So Einstein has two theories of relativity. The first one is the special theory in 1905. And the second one is called the general theory of relativity in 1915. Um, special doesn't mean kind of fancy. Special means specialized. So the special theory of relativity is a theory that's fairly restricted in what it can say about the world. It only works in very special situations, and it's later subsumed by this more general theory of relativity that came later. 
OK, let me tell you what the special theory says. Um, the essence of it is, is, is straightforward. The essence of it is that nothing can ever travel faster than the speed of light. So there's a speed limit in the universe. And the laws of physics conspire to make sure that nothing ever goes faster than the speed of light. Now, um, it took a long time to realize this. We don't notice this fact uh, in our everyday uh, lives simply because the speed of light is really, really fast. So this is the speed of light in meters per second. Um, if you prefer miles per hour, the speed of light is about 700 million <coughs> miles per hour. Okay. Very fast. Um, if you think about this for a little bit, it's really weird. Okay. Um, let, let me explain through, through an analogy. Um, there's a speed limit on the motorway. Right. The speed limit on the motorway is 70 miles per hour. Uh, of course, it's easy to evade the speed limit on the motorway. You just put your foot down and you go faster than 70 miles per hour. Um, imagine, and this is unfortunately likely to happen in the future, we're all driving cars that don't allow you to go faster than 70 miles per hour. Okay, Google designed some really fancy car where you just sort of, it stops at 70 miles an hour. Um, you might think that, that our world is a bit like that, that things just can't possibly go faster than some some speed limit, um, but it's more complicated. So the speed limit of 70 miles per hour on the motorway is relative to a person that's standing still on the side of the motorway. Okay? You get a speed camera, it's still on the side of the motorway, and it measures the speed coming towards you, and you shouldn't be going faster than 70. But what about the people in the other lane? So the people on the other side of the motorway are in their cars driving down at 70 miles per hour, and from their perspective, the cars that are coming towards them don't look as if they're doing 70 miles an hour. They look as if they're doing 140 miles per hour because it's 70 that you're going plus the 70 of the cars coming towards you. So that's how fast the cars are rushing towards you on the other side of the motorway. 70 plus 70 is, is 140. Okay. What about light? You would think that the same thing must be true of light. That if I take a torch and I shine a torch at you, the light leaves my hand and travels towards you at the speed of light, 700 million miles per hour. Okay. Now imagine running towards me at half the speed of light. Let's say you run towards me at 300 million miles per hour. So it's, it takes some physical exertion, but, but you know, it's a maths lecture. We can pretend these things. Um, how fast do you see the light coming out of the torch? So there's a really simple common sense answer, which is that it's the 700 miles per hour of the light plus the 300 of you rushing towards me. So you should see uh, light coming towards you at 300 plus 700 thousand million miles per hour, billion miles per hour. Right? It's just common sense. Um, one of the things we learned in the 20th century is that common sense is not a good way to understand the way the universe works. And that's not the answer. So the answer is that no matter how fast you run towards me, you always see the light traveling towards you at the speed of light, at this number here. You can never see anything faster than the speed of light, no matter what speed you're traveling at. So it's very, very different from what, what happens on the motorway. In fact, that statement that I told you earlier, that, um, that if you're going down the motorway at 70 miles an hour, you see the cars coming towards you at 70 miles per hour, that's also, sorry, if you're traveling down the motorway at 70, you see the cars coming towards you at 140, that's also wrong. Uh, there's a slight, very, very small correction to that. And the correct formula is something that Einstein discovered in 1905. This is the correct formula for how uh, uh, speeds add up. So, so V here is the speed of an object. It can be the speed of the car on the motorway, or it can be the speed of light. And U is the speed that, that you're traveling at. So if I'd asked you before this lecture about uh, about speeds, you would have probably thought the right formula was that the new speed that you observe things at is just v plus u without this, this thing on the bottom here. So that if the car is traveling at 70 and you're traveling towards the car at 70, the speed you see the cars at is, is 140. Einstein realized that's just not, not correct. This is the formula that describes the way speeds add in our world. So it's v plus u, but then you have to divide by this extra thing on the bottom, which is 1 plus u times v, you multiply the two speeds together, divided by the speed of light squared. Now, if u and v are both 70 miles per hour, this is 70 times 70 divided by 700 million squared. This is something that's 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 14. Right? It's just such a tiny number you don't realize. But when the speeds u and v get close to the speed of light, this becomes important. So let's see how this works just uh, 
um, uh, for a particular case. Suppose I shine light at you at a speed which is the speed of light. Let's try and understand from this formula what speed you measure it at if you run towards me at speed u. So this formula says that v nu, which is the speed you see the speed of light at, is u, sorry, is c plus u, where u is your speed, divided by 1 plus uv over c squared, but this v is the same thing as c. So I can take out a factor of c from the front there, and I get 1 plus u over c, and on the bottom it's 1 plus u over c, and these things just cancel. So this formula has this really nice property that no matter how fast you run towards light, you always see it coming towards you at exactly the same speed, c, it never changes. Good. So this was, this was not Einstein's original formula. Einstein took a long time to get to this formula. The way he really understood it was in terms of space uh, shrinking and time warping and all sorts of uh, wonderful ideas. Um, the mathematics behind special relativity is really very straightforward. It's really just the kind of maths you learn about in, in A-level physics. The ideas behind special relativity are really very deep and, and complicated. So it's really a, a very nice subject. Again, any university you go to to do maths or physics, it's something you'll learn in the, in the first year. Uh, maths is straightforward, but, but the underlying concepts about space and time shrinking and, uh, and expanding um, are somewhat more complicated. Good. So this is where Einstein was in 1905. He'd made a name for himself, and um, he had uh, he'd realized that, that there was a speed limit in the universe. Nothing could travel faster than the speed of light. Um, but he had a problem. And the problem was um, he realized that if his theory was correct, Newton's theory of gravity could not be correct. So they couldn't both be right. One of them had to give. I told you Einstein was kind of cocky. He was pretty sure it was Newton that was going to be wrong. Um, this is uh, Einstein's question, the thing that puzzled him. Um, the Earth goes around the sun, uh, and it goes around the sun, as we've seen, in an ellipse, but it's almost a circle. It's very, very close to a circle. Um, and it goes around the sun once a year. So Einstein's question is the following. Um, suppose that the sun was to explode, what would happen? The sun's not going to explode, but just you know, suppose it did. Um, now, the sun's a long way away. The sun uh, is so far away, it takes light eight minutes to get from the sun to us, uh, which means that when we look at the sun, we're not seeing the sun as it is now. We're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And in particular, if the sun was to explode, there'd be eight glorious minutes where we just wouldn't have a clue. We'd be sitting here, basking in the light of the sun, completely oblivious to what was going to happen eight minutes down the road. But Einstein's question was, was what about gravity? So the Earth goes around the sun in almost a circle. Um, if the sun wasn't there, there'd be no reason for the Earth to go in a circle. It would just move on a straight line through space. So Einstein's question was, when does the Earth realize it should stop going in a circle and it should start traveling in a straight line? So when does the effect of gravity get communicated, or how long does it take the effect of gravity to get communicated from the sun to the Earth? So Einstein went back to Newton's equation. There's no time delay in Newton's equation. Newton's equation just says, happens immediately. As soon as the sun disappears, the Earth will start to move in a straight line. But Einstein had already figured out that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, not even uh, the effect of gravity. So Einstein was pretty sure that what would happen is the Earth would continue to move in a circle or an ellipse for about eight minutes, and only then would it realize the sun wasn't there anymore and it would drift off in a straight line. So that was the problem that, that Einstein was worried about. Um, so in, in case it's not obvious, you know, Einstein wasn't the most pragmatic physicist that, that ever lived. You know, the sun explodes, and all he cares about is this stupid question about whether the Earth goes in a circle for eight minutes or straight line straight away. Um, but he's kind of unique amongst physicists. This is really how he did science. He would sort of construct these, these childish little stories in his head and then push them to the limits and figure out you know, where they didn't quite make sense. And then that's, that's what he'd focus on. That was really one of the things that made him such a great physicist. So um, Einstein thought about this. Um, and he thought about this for a long, long time. It took him eight years to get uh, to the final answer. He first, he first started thinking seriously in 1907. 
Um, and at first he thought, well, he could just tinker with that equation due to Newton and, and put in a time delay effect. And that, that just doesn't work. Um, and uh, yeah, he spent a long time dwelling on this. So I, I'd, I'd like to tell you the story about how Einstein figured out the theory of general relativity, um, in part just because it's a great story. It's like something from, from a Hollywood movie. Um, but also in part because when you learn about science, um, it very often seems that it's all inevitable, that one person discovers something and then the next person discovers something. And you know, it's just sort of this, uh, this ongoing development. And it's not like that at all in real life. When people are at the, the edge of science, everybody is confused. No one has a clue what's going on. And I think this story sort of really shows that for, for one of the greatest scientists that ever lived. Um, so as I said, he first started thinking about it in 1907. Um, and for the first four years, he was doing other things. Um, but from 1911 onwards, uh, he was focused just on this question about how long gravity takes to move from, uh, from the sun to the Earth. Um, it's also worth mentioning, no one else cared. This was such an exciting time in physics. People were understanding the structure of the atom and quantum theory was being developed. No one else cared at all about this, this question of gravity. It was just Einstein on his own who just was, got obsessed with this, with this question. Um, so Einstein first thought he'd got the answer in 1913. In 1913, Einstein wrote a paper that he called uh, an outline of general relativity. And it didn't quite work. There were a few little gaps. But he figured you know, he could fill those in later. Everything would fall into place. He thought basically he'd, he'd nailed you know, the, uh, the structure of the theory, the framework of, of, of what was going on. But then, you know, over the next couple of years, he starts trying to fill in these gaps, and it just doesn't quite work. The, the, the cracks that he's found kind of get bigger and bigger over the years. Um, and things come to a, a head in the summer of 1915. So in the summer of 1915, Einstein uh, goes from Berlin, where he lives, uh, to the German town of Göttingen, um, where he's been asked to give a series of lectures on his theory of gravity. Um, and in Göttingen is a guy called David Hilbert. Has anyone ever heard of David Hilbert? No one. If I'd have asked that question, one person, okay. If I'd have asked that question uh, 100 years ago, everybody in the room, no matter what the room was, would have put their hand up. David Hilbert was like the Albert Einstein of his day or the Stephen Hawking of, of his day. He was um, almost certainly the, the greatest mathematician that was alive at the time, but he was really a famous figure. He was one of the only scientists in the world that people would... would Recognize in the street. So um, Einstein went to Göttingen and uh, gives this series of lectures. And David Hilbert's right on the front row and taking furious notes and really engaged in what Einstein is saying. Um, Einstein gets back after the week, and he's so happy that finally you know, someone is taking him seriously. Someone is, is listening to his ideas about, about gravity. Um, and then two things happen. Uh, the first is that Einstein realizes it's all wrong. And everything he's been working on for two years just, just doesn't work. You know, he thought he'd figured out the theory of gravity, and it's just it's not the way the universe works. Nothing makes sense. You know, all of those cracks just sort of spread all over the theory, and nothing's right. Um, secondly, Einstein gets a letter from David Hilbert, uh, which says basically, um, really enjoyed your lectures. This is really interesting stuff. Um, but I, I don't think it's right, uh, and I've decided I'm going to start working on this. So Einstein spent eight years of his life um, working on gravity. Um, no one else has cared. Uh, suddenly, he's realized that most of what he's done is wrong. And now he's got competition. And the competition is the greatest mathematician in the world. Um, Einstein's not very happy. He gets depressed for a little while. Um, then suddenly, he, he sort of shakes himself out of that. And he decides he's just going to do this. Uh, and he sort of launches himself into this work with uh, a focus um, at an intensity which you know, is maybe unrivaled in, in all of human history. Um, he forgets to sleep. He forgets to eat. He just spends all his time trying to solve this, this problem about gravity. Um, and it goes on for months. It's not just a few weeks. It just goes on for months and months and months. Finally, it gets to November 1915. And Einstein uh, has agreed um, to give a series of lectures at a place called the Prussian Academy of Sciences. So this is a meeting place in Berlin where all the best scientists in the world get together. Um, Einstein's agreed to give a series of lectures, one a week, um, on his theory of gravity. He, he agreed to do this back earlier in the year when he thought he had a theory of gravity, but now he's got to stand up in front of these guys and he's got nothing at all to tell them. So uh, he cobbles enough together just to give the first lecture. 
Um, and from then on, uh, he's kind of working in real time. He has to spend his week so trying to solve this problem, which, which he struggled with for eight years. And at the end of the week, he stands up in front of the Prussian Academy and, and tells them what he's figured out that week. Um, finally, two days before the last lecture, he cracks it. And when he's got it, this equation is just so perfect and so beautiful, it, there's no doubt at all that it's right. So on the 25th of November, 1915, Einstein stands up in front of the Prussian, Prussian Academy of Sciences and announces to the world the theory of general relativity that he figured out 48 hours before. This is what he told them. Um, you, you know, you all probably know one of Einstein's equations. Einstein has loads of equations, but his famous one is E equals mc squared, right? It's this beautiful little equation. Um, this is the one that physicists really mean, though, when they're talking about the Einstein equation. This is what, what they have in mind. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, briefly what, what it means. Um, this is pretty advanced. You know, I said special relativity you learn in the first year of an undergraduate degree. General relativity... Um, you learn only at the very end of, uh, of a degree. I, I think this is the most advanced thing we teach to physics students, the most advanced mathematics we teach to undergraduate physics students. So let me give you a sense about what this equation is, is telling us. Um, this is uh, a picture of empty space. So before Einstein, we kind of had this vision of empty space as a stage on which the laws of physics play out, just a place in which stuff happens. And Einstein's great insight was to realize that that's not what empty space is like. Empty space isn't this passive thing in which stuff happens. Space is dynamic. And if something happens in space, space responds to that in some way. So here's a way to, uh, to visualize it. This um, is what happens if you take something heavy, like the Earth, and you put it in space. So if you do that, um, space, as I said, responds. And it kind of bends and warps around the Earth. So it's no longer flat, but somehow space and time gets curved around the Earth. Then you take some other object, like the moon, and you roll the moon past the Earth. And the, Earth, the moon feels the way that space bends and curves due to the Earth. And it's just like a marble rolling in a bowl. The, the moon starts to bend around the Earth just responding to the way space and time are, are curved. That's what we call the effect of gravity. It's not, as Newton thought, some force between two objects. What we call gravity is uh, heavy stuff distorting space and time around them and other heavy stuff reacting to the distorted space and time. This was Einstein's great vision of the universe. Um, how am I doing? I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the mathematics behind this. It's, it might be a little too, too hairy, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of the mathematics behind this. Uh, be, before I do this, let me just um, give you uh, the, the punchline of the talk. So I said at the beginning, if you take away one thing from this talk, it's that general relativity is a theory of gravity. If you take away two things from this talk, it's that uh, general relativity is a theory of gravity. And what we think of as gravity is space and time bending due to heavy stuff uh, sitting there. Let, let me, um, I'll spend five minutes with a bit of mathematics, and then we'll move on to some, to some uh, pretty pictures. Um, I'm going to try and explain to you how uh, you write down the mathematics of curved space. Okay? And I won't quite get to that equation, the Einstein equation, but I'll, I'll tell you the kind of things that, that we're talking about. Um, suppose the following. Suppose you've got flat space. Okay, so here's, here's a picture of flat space. Here's some axes, and here's uh, some coordinates on axes. So any point in three-dimensional space, you can specify by giving me three numbers, the x, y, and z coordinates of, uh, of that point. So here's a point x, y, and z. Okay. Suppose there's a nearby point here, which has slightly different numbers x, y, and z, and to show you that they're slightly different, I'm going to call this x plus delta x, where the delta is supposed to mean this is something small. Okay? And y plus delta y and z plus delta z. 
And then the question I want to ask is, what's the, dis different, what's the, difference, what's the distance between this point and this point? Well, this is something Pythagoras knew. This is just, uh, you, well, the distance squared is delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared. So the distance is the square root of, of the right-hand side. OK. That's how you describe distances in flat space. What happens if space is curved? So suppose, just for a simple example, we take uh, the sphere. How do you, do, how do you describe um, the distance between two points on a sphere where you're not allowed to take a shortcut through the middle of the sphere, you're obliged to kind of go around the surface of the sphere. So, you know, it's a sensible question. What's the shortest distance between here and Paris? You don't get to bury through the earth. You have to go, go around. How do you describe that mathematically? Well, you do the following. Firstly, um, so here's the sphere. And firstly, you need a way to specify where you sit on the sphere. And so for that, you introduce some coordinates. And the coordinates we're going to use here, theta and phi, are basically what we call, I always get these wrong, but latitude and longitude. And one of them is latitude and one of them is longitude. I think longitude is the going round one. So you start at the North Pole, and you introduce some angle theta. And theta tells you how far you are from from the North Pole. So, so theta equals 0 is here. Theta equals 180 is here. Or if you're used to radians, this is theta equals pi. Uh, then you can spin around. And there's some other angle that I'll call phi, which tells you how far around you are. So this is the way we measure the other one, long, long, longitude. So, so phi equals 0 is, is said to be where Greenwich is, just for historical reasons. And then moving phi from 0 to 360, you go around around the Earth. Good. So let's take some point on the Earth. And some point that's close by. And ask, what's the distance to get from, from here to here? Okay. So how do you, how do, you do that? Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sketch how you do it. Firstly, um, if you've got an x, y, and z axis buried in the middle of this sphere, this is how you figure out, given an x, y, and z coordinate, where you are on the sphere. And if you sum up x squared plus y squared plus z squared using cos squared plus sine squared is equal to 1, you'll find that the sum of these squares is always equal to r squared, which is the statement that the, this defines a, a sphere. <coughs> So the way you work this out is, is the following. It's some kind of differentiation. And I think given, given the time, I'm just going to tell you the answer and then let you think about why, why this might be. Um, suppose you move from some point here to some other point by some small amount, delta theta and delta, delta phi. The question I want to ask is, how far do you move in x, y, and z? And I've written the answers here. And you can see it's very closely related to differentiation. How many people have seen differentiation in, in AS? Perfect. Good. So, so x is a function of theta and phi. And you see that the amount you move in the x coordinate is it's as if I've differentiated sine theta, which differentiates to cos theta, times delta phi, and as if I've differentiated the sine phi, which goes to minus, sorry, which goes to plus cos phi times delta phi. So as I said, I'm just going to sort of leave you to think why differentiation might possibly be important in this. But these are the answers for if you move a little bit around the sphere, how much you move in the x, y, and z directions. Once you know that, you can figure out the distance squared, because you know the distance squared in the x, y, and z directions, because that's just, just Pythagoras. So plugging this formula here into this, and again, you've got to use the sine squared plus cos squared equals 1 quite a lot, you find out that this is the distance in a sphere. So let, let's try and understand why that is. So here's a sphere. And theta equals 0 is, is up there. And here's the equator. And what this formula is telling us is that if you move a little bit in the delta phi direction, that's a little bit around, the amount you actually move depends on where you are coming down in the theta direction. OK? 
because there's a sine squared theta here. But that makes sense. Suppose you move one degree around the Earth, so that's one three hundred and sixtieth of the way around the Earth. Then if you're at the equator, one three hundred and sixtieth is a further distance than if you're up here, just because these circles shrink as, as you go up. If you're really at the North Pole and you move one degree around, you don't move at all, right? The, the, there is no meaning to phi at the North Pole. So if you shift in phi, you just stay where you are. So this is the way that we describe distances on a sphere in terms of theta and, and phi. Now, what Einstein realized is the same thing is going on in, in uh, space and time itself, that if you want to describe space and time, distances aren't described by uh, this Pythagoras uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared that the Greeks thought up. It's much more complicated, and it's something with you know, weird extra factors here and there. So I'm just going to flash up very quickly, although I won't, won't explain it. Um, this is the distances in space and time uh, for a black hole or it's actually also the distances for space and time around the Earth. So this is, um, I'm just going to move on, actually. This is a black hole. <laughs> let, let me finish with, with a story for the last five minutes. Um, it's been 100 years since Einstein came up with general relativity, um, and you know, we've just got overwhelming evidence for, for this theory. It explains the, the more accurately the motions of the planets. It explains how light bends around, around stars. It explains how time warps and slows down. We've done experiments to test that. Um, it explains how the universe expands, why the universe expands. Um, of all of these things, though, there's one prediction that Einstein came up with 100 years ago that we haven't yet got any direct evidence for. And it's something called gravity waves. So the idea is the following. If space and time is dynamic, then um, rather like if you drop a stone on the surface of a pond, you get these waves coming out. If you do anything dramatic in space and time, there are ripples of space which move away. So if I'm here on stage and do star jumps, I create little ripples in space and time which propagate out at the speed of light. Okay? They're so tiny you can never measure them but there are much more dramatic events in the universe where we would hope to measure them. We have stars exploding in our galaxy. We have black holes uh, colliding. We have neutron stars colliding. Uh, this is a simulation of two black holes which are spiraling into each other and will ultimately uh, collide. We understand from Einstein's theory how many gravity waves, these ripples, that, that they emit. And we're now at the stage where we're building experiments which should be able to detect these uh, these gravity waves. So the best experiments we have um, uh, are in the US. They go by the name of a LIGO experiment, L-I-G-O. Um, there are two of them, uh, one in Louis the state of Louisiana, one in the state of Washington. Um, they're kind of astonishing. They're, they're two buildings at right angles, and each building is about two and a half miles long. And in these buildings, they fire laser beams backwards and forwards, constantly measuring the size of the building. It's two and a half miles two and a half miles, but measuring the size of the building to about the accuracy of the width of an atom. So it's pretty incredible. What happens is these um, gravity waves from black holes in space or exploding stars, if they were to pass through the Earth, the entire Earth would just sort of shrink a little bit and then breathe out again. And these experiments are going to measure when that happens. Um, at the moment, um, this particular experiment has closed down. It starts again later this year, and we think it's really going to have the sensitivity to detect these ripples of space-time uh, moving, moving through the universe. Meanwhile, um, earlier this year, something um, remarkable happened. Who knows what this is a picture of? Microwave background. Microwave background. Good. So, so this is... Um, it goes by the technical name, Cosmic Microwave Background. Um, it's a rubbish name. This is a photograph of the fireball of the Big Bang. So 14 billion years ago, there was a fireball that filled the universe. We know it was there because we've taken a photograph of it, and this is the photograph. Okay? Um, looking at the flickers in here um, really tell us all the inf most of the information we have about the Big Bang and, uh, and what was happening there. Um, earlier this year... Um, a team uh, 
in the South Pole. This is their telescope. It's called the BICEP-2 telescope. Um, studied a very specific patch of this sky and found something um, that took everybody by surprise. So they studied uh, a patch near the South Pole, which is somewhere near here. This is the picture that, that they found. Um, and so here's the picture blown up. So this is some tiny little bit of the microwave background. And you can see that there are black lines that, that we've drawn on this, or they've drawn on this. Those black lines are polarization. So that's really what they discovered. You know, if light travels towards you, it can travel towards you in one of two ways. It can either do that as it goes towards you, or it can do that as it goes towards you. They managed for the first time to understand in some detail the polarization of the microwave background. And you can see that there's kind of this fingerprint-like <coughs> pattern as the polarization, which is these black lines that are drawn here, sort of swirls around uh, the red bit, which is a hot spot um, in this microwave background. So there's something new that we've seen uh, in the light from the Big Bang. And the question is, what can cause this? So the technical name is B-mode polarization. Um, what could possibly be giving rise to this, this swirling pattern uh, in the Big Bang light? Um, there's two things that we know of that, that could cause it. Uh, the first is that there could have been gravity waves created during the Big Bang itself, ripples of space and time, which imprinted themselves on this light and gave rise to that, that swirling pattern. Okay? Um, if this is true, this is the single most exciting thing I've heard in science in 20 years. I mean, it's just head and shoulders above, above anything else, about the discovery of the Higgs boson or, or anything else in terms of importance. This is the most important thing that, uh, uh, that's happened. Unfortunately, um, there's something else that could give rise to this, uh, which is just random dust. So um, not dust in our atmosphere, but dust out there in the galaxy. It turns out as the light travels through the galaxy, this dust could, could if the dust spins, it basically puts this little twist on the light and gives rise to exactly this same effect, this swirling of, of the polarization. Um, so, so which is it? Um, on March 17th, when these results were announced, the scientist who did this study um, had, uh, well, had tried to understand the, bus the, the dust as best they could and had decided um, that there wasn't enough dust to give rise to this effect. This had to be gravity waves in, in the Big Bang. Um, that doesn't seem to quite be true now. Um, the actual answer is we don't know. We, we don't know how much dust is out there in the galaxy. And so we don't know what's causing uh, this swirling pattern in the Big Bang, or the picture of the Big Bang. Um, but the good news is we're going to find out. So at least within the next six months, and everybody on the planet, everybody who cares about cosmology suddenly cares about dust. No one cared about dust at all before. Suddenly it's all anybody's thinking about. Um, and, and within the next six months, we have other experiments looking at this, uh, people doing the calculations. So very soon we're going to figure out if we've got some new evidence for gravity waves in the Big Bang, or if we've just discovered some random crappy dust in, in the galaxy. Um, I wanted to tell you this story because, you know, again, when you learn science at school, it's, it's kind of as if everything's figured out already and, you know, we know what's, uh, what's going on. And it's not the case. There's so many things that we're just confused about in the universe, in, including dust. Um, so, I, you know, I hope you all go to university, do a degree in maths or physics or whatever interests you. If you do decide to do a degree in maths and physics, the very worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to get a really well-paid job working in finance or IT or consultancy or something like this. Um, but I hope that some of you after this degree will think about coming to join us um, in, in understanding what's going on here and just sort of being confused with the rest of us and, and maybe uh, making some progress in, in understanding this. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you.